out sessions. Yeah, okay. Welcome back in the big room. We're going to get started with the next plenary momentarily. Those of you who are in line, don't worry about it. Stay in line, but uh, you're going to be able to hear, hear out there in the food line because we have speakers, because there's super high-tech Aspen Institute stuff going on. So, you know how we do. Uh, Monique Miles doesn't put together anything, or Yelena, without connecting the head and the heart. Um, anybody feel it in their heart when they got to hear the trombone shorty, young people? Let's keep that going. Um, so it's my privilege to introduce to you all Emmanuel Lee, outspoken bean, with writers in the schools and head coach of Metaphor Houston, the current reigning Brave New Voices Youth Poetry Slam champs, Emmanuel Lee. Hello? Hello? Hey. How are y'all? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Y'all, that's what y'all gonna do? You gonna lie to me? <laughs> Very first question I ever give you? Let's try that again, right? This time, from, from your soul, from your stomach, from your heart, right? You're gonna give me some energy, all right? All right? How are y'all? There it is. Yes, 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 yes. All right. So my name is Outspoken Bean. I am, as, as it was just said, I'm the head coach of Metaphor Houston. And I am really excited. This is my first time being here at the Aspen Institute. This is the first time writers in the schools, um, which is the organization I work for, based in Houston, Texas. This is our first time being here as well. So it's a lot of firsts going on. And I want to introduce you to uh, some some. So three other people who also have, um, who will have a first time experience as well. Um, um, if we could start clapping for the Metaphor Houston team, y'all. <laughs> right? And, um, and Metaphor, this past summer in July, we, we, uh, we flew all the way to San Francisco and to win. Yeah, you Speaks, what's up? You Speaks, what's up? Bay Area was good, right? Um, and, then, um, and then no teams from that area won the championship because we did. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? We, we did, right? Let's clap it up for these champions right here, y'all. Right? And, and so, so here's some things. As they're performing, we have... We have uh, Kylan Denny, right, who goes to Stanford, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. We have Isabella, who goes to Washington University. Yeah. All right. And we have Ariana, who also goes to Stanford University, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Very excited for them to be here. And here's some things, right? As they're spitting, as they're as they're as they're spitting, I wanna I wanna make sure that we're all in co communication. This is not borders, okay? This nothing is borders anymore. Am I right? Uh, this is not this is not your bookstore uh, uh, poetry reading. All right, this is this is performance poetry, right? And this is a a communal thing, right? This is a conversation, a dialogue that's going to be happening. And how you can let them know you're into their work is you can do a few things. You can snap your fingers, right? Let me see you snap. Let me see you snap. You can tap on the table, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can, you can create thunder. You can stomp. Let me hear that. Create some thunder. Right, right, right. As they're performing. Or you can, you can cheer. You can cheer. Let me hear y'all cheer. Yeah, because they're going to say some things that's going to touch your souls, touch your hearts, ladies and gentlemen. And so with that being said, I just want to go ahead without further ado and introduce y'all to Metaphor Houston. Let's get in. Good afternoon, how is everyone doing? My name is Ariana Lee, I'm a freshman at Stanford University and I'm also the 2023 Houston Youth Poet Laureate. Thank you. Uh, I wrote this poem for an interdisciplinary artistic collaboration I did earlier this year with a choreographer named Sora Yang. Uh, she created an all-female dance set. So I wrote this poem about female empowerment and it's titled Tables. If King Arthur's rounds table 
was created in the image of equality. Tell me why no woman held a seat. That legend, like inequity, has existed for centuries. When I was little, tables taught me the order of the world, from the periodic table to the multiplication table, to teachers saying I need three strong boys to help me move this table. I learned that even round tables did not want to make room for me. Instead, I'd have to fight every other girl for the same seat to prove my strength outside of masculinity and be ladylike. I questioned what being a lady is like. What do ladies even like? My mother was a waitress who set tables. Now, as a doctor, she likes to put food on them for me and my sister. You can tell me fathers are the handy men, but my mom knows how to build. Women create our own tables. Be it out of necessity, be it out of love, this tabletop is our safe space. And you don't have to look far to see the courage and care under its surface. Like my mother, the generations of women who built before us furnish our future. They deserve their flowers, so let's lay it all out on the table. Someone once told me that women of color are more likely to use diminutive words, such as just and sorry and might. But for a more just world, women taught me to not say sorry when using my might. The enemy is the system, not each other, so there's no need for constant competition. Sister, you are my constant in this competition. Together, we're one unstoppable contestant. Whether our clothes are tight or loose, whether we wear heels or sneakers, whether we sway our hips or hit hard, we define what's ladylike. There is no singular type of feminine movement, and there is no stopping the feminist movement, because dance is movement never ending, and a woman is power never never bending to accept the scraps from the table. The day moves when we unite. Come celebrate this ladies' night when I have all my sisters with me. Just watch how we can turn tables. Thank you. Hi, my name is Isabella. I'm a freshman at Washington University in St. Louis. And the poem I will be performing is about gun violence and connecting it to an extended metaphor about being stung by a bee. And this poem is called Sting. When a bee stings someone, its stinger gets stabbed in the skin and when it tries to pull away, the stinger gets stuck causing the bee's body to rip into two. The stinger gets stabbed in the skin like a bullet, a cold piece of metal buried towards the blood, not a stinger, but the product of a gun, the grim reaper encased in a searing iron. At least bees bring us honey, and when they sting, they're defending themselves. But were you defending yourself when you stormed into that classroom? Did you feel threatened by the students laughing in the halls? I wish you were just a bee, a mere creature I could kill with the bottom of my shoe, but nothing can stop the pain you want to entertain. No, you're not a bee. Your body doesn't break into two when you shoot. In fact, I feel like you're multiplying. A swarm of creatures rushing towards the places I thought I was safe. Safe from the metal craving my skin, but you seem to be searching for my blood as if it were your pollen. A bee stinger seethes in venom, while a gunman's bullet is fueled by a venomous momentum. I can't run from the poison that's claimed my heart as its target. I don't feel safe here or anywhere because you've possessed our fears, making us desire a world in which guns aren't more valued than our lives. Now we're combing through the memories, thinking about the way you've built your honeycomb off of our homes, taking pleasure in the bloodshed that we've learned to expect. But our futures shouldn't be restricted by America's greed. This mass industry that fuels a country in which our calamities are worth large stacks of money. As if you can drench us in honey to sugarcoat the tragedies we live through every day. Our blood is still being hunted because it is your pollen. 
You build hives out of lives, these colonies of death America doesn't try to exterminate. So we watch swarms inflict pain as bloodstains coat our fears and the sounds of their stingers becomes too real. We can't reel back from the sharp tip of such a small creation because it's embedded in this nation. But maybe, maybe if I run fast enough, the bees won't confuse me for their pollen. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kylan Denny. I'm a freshman at Stanford University. And I wrote this poem about the slang term um, called dog when someone says you got that dog in you because <laughs> Because I wanted to draw an important parallel between how it's now used as a compliment, but before it was often used as a way to degrade black people in America. And this is called Dog. Grr. Girl, don't get it twisted. This poet shit is mine. Call me DMX the way I ain't come to play fetch. When I step up to a mic, know I got something burning deep down. I'm talking about all up in this area. Every line is a snap back, spinning the bark of a rabid dog. Guttural, unmistakable. My mother always told me, walk with your chest puff, head held high. Everyone should know when my presence is on stage. Don't you know I got that dog in me? Zoned in, tuned out to the bullshit. Even when people tried to rake me through the mud without shame, they took my kindness for weakness and criticize my integrity. See, now I'm under the impression some might think all dogs like to play games. These girls at my school always tried to play fetch with my dignity. The way they laugh in my face said I was annoying and had the audacity to call me a female dog. But this bitch bites back and won't take a low down and so lying on my back. Beware of dog, cause kids will taunt an animal, but tuck tail and run. Won't say a slick comment to my face knowing they're barking up the wrong tree. And we all know, Imitation is the highest form of flattery. So pipe down, puppy, before I dog walk you. Cause the dog in me ain't nice and my bark is worse than my bite. If you weren't an old dog, I'd teach you how to be a bad bitch. <laughs> but the best you'll ever be is a new trick. I had to work hard for my success in spite of those trying to muzzle me, take me down, valedictorian of my graduating high school class, and 1.9 million offered in scholarships is a sign of the relentless motivation pushing me out the gate. I'm running on all four paws. Untouchable was the title we laid to every man who got that dog in him. But what about the beast that boils just beneath? White woman's tears paints the little black boys as beasts. Dangerous monsters at bay. Try to call eye contact some wretched attempt at bestiality. Walking with too much pride in your pace, chest puffed out was taken as a threat. They tried to dehumanize us to nothing but rabid dogs who needed the savage ripped out of their throats. Had a generation convinced all dogs go to heaven when they hung black bodies in trees for unchecked, untamed behavior. But my mother's maiden name is Lynch. So yes, this blood runs deep and is kept as a family heirloom. Nothing makes a dog more wild than seeing our bones dangling in the distance. My family had to work hard to see the only thing hanging on wooden stumps was college degrees. We had to define ourselves as independent hustler makers chasing a bag and not being chased by the fear of white terror. My pride, my pack, my family tree is rooted in knowing we never let go of that ruthless drive in us. We got that dog barking in us and it's a bloodhound stimming out its prey, praying its true toy is a white rope. Chasing the souls of those who bared their faces in white sheets and tried to hide under the ashes. You're the one who let this dog out. Oh, 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 oh. And ignorance isn't what we claim and won't be what keeps us at bay. So tell me, what's more dangerous than me off my leash? Thank you. bow y'all should bow y'all should bow thank you so much thank you for having us thank you thank you
¿Qué hubo la familia? What's up? What up, familia? Uh, for those that are still bilingually challenged, uh, we're gonna we're gonna learn something here today, a lot. Um, but first and foremost, uh, I want to invoke the words of my ancestors: Scarupe yadatu nala ya Juan chinge Alicia chinge Isabel. Welcome, family and community. My name is Juan, son of Alicia, grandson of Isabel. My people hail from the Istmo de Tehuantepe, Oaxaca. Uh, I am mestizo of the Beneditza people, of the cloud people. Uh, we're called the cloud people because that is our origin story, that we come from the clouds uh, and we were born from the gods that embodied uh, hope for us. And, and in, if you ever have been to Oaxaca, you probably have heard about our food and everything that, that comes with that. But the Istmos is towards the coast in the mountains uh, and straddling the, the coast. And those mountains are up in the clouds. And so that's, that's another reason why we're cloud, called the cloud people. Um, in a more formal way, my name is Juan Daniel Martinez Pineda. I carry both, name, both last names because in our ways, uh, we carry both of our parents' names forward uh, and into our lineage. And so uh, that, and I have the high honor and pleasure of being a part of the Aspen Forum team, of being here with you all to celebrate and embrace the changes and the call for action that our young people center at all times. And so there's a couple of values that we'll be hearing about today through the belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose panel. I know many of you have been waiting to hear the concepts and the definitions of what these words mean and the research and the data and the qualitative and the quantitative, all words that I have come to learn today. But more than anything, that, I ha that my, uh, the young leaders are teaching me the ways of. And so there's, there's a couple of common core values that we at Fresh Track Center Fresh Tracks is a part of the Forum family. It is a project that centers the healing power of culture and the outdoors for civic action. And where we start off is that in the same way that people talk about generational trauma, we also have to speak about generational joy. Because the resilience and the power, thank you, uh, and the power of that, we can't speak about one without speaking about the other. We can't just point to the negative without talking about what's good in my hood. Like, those are the embodiments of who we are as the foreign fam uh, and moving forward. There's an old motto, not old motto, but like a constant motto in everything that we do. Uh, if uh, I, I worked six years as, at, at an organization that many of you may know of uh, called the Association for Community Organizations for Reform Now. ACORN for short, uh, so I have my, uh, my scars and, and wear them proudly from those days. And there's a couple of values and practices that that experience has, has taught me. One of them is that those closest to the pain must be closest to the power. And uh, Representative Ayanna Presley has always centered that, and I, and I invoke her words and, and presence into this room as well, too. I also think about uh, uh, our very own Dr. Nanette, um, who uh, has taught me so much in, in terms of research and development and what the, the power of data is. And I invoke her words all the Is Nanette here? Where is she? Where is Nanette? Um, if you haven't met Nanette, uh, please make sure you, see, you seek her out. But she taught me this, and that's that those, close, those with the data have the power. So if we're tracking here, those closest to the pain must be closest to the power, but the power is with the data. You see where I'm going here a little bit. And then the, the last uh, value and practice in that is that work yourself out of a job. Community organizing 101 is not just about like uh, uh, doing the work forever, me holding the podium forever, or us holding the mic forever, or doing the work forever. 
Uh, anybody that is a good community organizer knows that in order to be successful at community organizing, it is your job to create the pathway for other people to step into that leadership role so that they can continue the work forward as many people have done for us in our own ways and our ancestors and the resilience of that movement is still palpable and, and alive today. Uh, Michael from Policy Link reminded us this morning that we, this is liberation work. And in the center of liberation work, uh, you'll hear a little bit about the well-being project here from Andrea and I in a bit. But in order to center liberation work, we also have to recognize that a lot of the, wor the ways and systems that we have been building upon are very Eurocentric, very binary. And as we start to indigenize and call into our roots, whether those are from Africa, those are from Europe, those are from Asia, or South, uh, South America, Turtle Island, wherever those uh, roots are, uh, we were never a binary people. We were m multiple uh, in, in the ways that we seek out our own connections to that. And we are not not uh, afraid of the magic, to, to Steve's point earlier this, this, this morning. The magic is what makes us who we are. It is the unexplainable sometimes. And I think sometimes we can get lost in trying to explain it way too much, trying to measure it and, and make it work for something. And so I wanna embrace you all, as Dr. King once reminded us uh, that he has a dream, to dream with us. He didn't say, I have a nightmare because he very well could have. He said, I have a dream. And you're gonna hear about a lot of dreams from, from, from the panelists today. Um, and so I invite you to, to share in that and, and do that. Finally, um, there's, you know those moments and those people that you meet and you're like, I want to work with you one day. And th there's so much that happens in like five minutes or like 10 minutes or like over a nightcap and so much laughter and so much love and so much joy, but also so much, so rooted in community and in, and in dreaming big, but making stuff happen. If you can think about one of those people, uh, hold them close to your heart. Uh, and I invite you to, uh, on the count of three, bring their name into the room. All right, one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you for making this space sacred in that space in the ways that we do because that's what you've just done uh, because it is those people. One of those people for me is Geneva Wiki. So Geneva uh, is our director of belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose. Um, it is a pretty long title, but... <laughs> Uh, we are we are working on figuring out if there's there's different mentalities that uh, different titles to explore there. But nevertheless, she is an amazing leader, someone that I am always learning from. And with that, Geneva, come on up. Are you queen? everyone. I am Geneva Wiki. I am the director of Belonging, Meaning, Wellbeing, and Purpose. And I'm so excited about this conversation and the rest of the conversations that we'll be having this week. Um, and I love that there are so many indigenous um, languages that you'll hear on stage. So I want to just introduce myself in my language and say, Naknao Geneva Wiki, Rakwe Mewo Mechak. Ashland Auk. I come from the village of Rakwe at the mouth of the Klamath River on the Yurok Reservation. And, um, and, and I just want to name why I was so compelled to come and do this work. And for Yuroks, like most native communities, traditionally our education models, our family structures, our justice systems, our child welfare systems were designed in a way in which every young person were, was able to find their purpose and was able to thrive and knew they deeply belonged because the health, the safety, the well-being of our villages and our communities was dependent on the well-being of every single young person. It, that's still true today, right? But what um, I love is that I know what's possible, um, and I know that we can um, transform our sy systems back into ways in which every young person can thrive. 
So this panel today is about belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose. And although that seems like a, a lot of words all strung together, I just want to say this is not new work. Um, as, um, as our friends in Hawaii will say, we know that a lot of this is based on ancient wisdom. And I just want to give a little bit of context about how we got here before I invite our panelists up. So from the very first plenary when this network launched over a decade ago, we were acknowledged how structural racism is at the root of issues facing opportunity youth in our country. This work of belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose builds on this decade's worth of insights from all of you, our young people, um, our, uh, our funders, our national partners, and then some of these academics and research and thought leaders, like in 2017 when we had um, John Powell come with the Othering and Belonging Institute, we learned more about the power of belonging with meaning-making interventions that we heard from Arnold Chandler and the outsized positive and long-term impacts of identity-based meaning-making and the impacts it has on education and employment outcomes for youth and young adults of color. And then thank you to the young leaders who demanded that we take up the issues of well-being and are now leading and have been leading our well-being research project. As Juan said, we now have a definition of well-being that includes freedom from racial trauma and is pointing towards joy. And now, and we're, we're now adding purpose, and you will um, hear from Professor Anthony Burrow briefly today and more in depth tomorrow at our lunchtime pl um, closing plenary that this sense of purpose can have a profoundly positive impact on one's life trajectory. And we know all too well that not all of our young people are given the opportunity or told the story that they can have a life of purpose or a purposeful life. So this frame of belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose was also guided by Dr. Sean Jenwright's call to name the vision that we want and not the vision that we don't want. When he um, shared with us years ago that shift from trauma-informed to healing-centered, as our colleague Jamil often says, the H in BMWP is silent and it stands for healing. And the idea of healing-centered youth engagement and healing-centered youth organizing is also at the core of this work. So let me just name that we are at the beginning of what we're thinking about as a three-year learning journey, but really a decade's worth of work ahead. And so as we imagine this, we, today we'll delve deep into the, the interconnected concepts of each of these words. But our goal is really to craft a more compelling and cohesive vision for like how do we operationalize racial equity? How do we create that world that we heard Michael McAfee talk about this morning where all young people experience profound belonging, a deep sense of purpose, and amazing well-being? And as we've always said, um, and I don't know if Cynthia, Cynthia the Dreamweaver is in the house, but our vision is always that young people are the protagonists of their own story. So in addition to the large bodies of evidence-based research and quantitative data that you're going to hear about in a quick minute, we also know that this work is deeply rooted in the work that you will have been doing on the ground for a very long time. Um, so we just want to give a few shout outs to, oops, we'll just keep going. Um, to work in uh, commu youth-led community organizing and all of our youth-centered organizing across the network, um, to projects like Project Butterfly um, in New Orleans, uh, to our partners in Hawaii, um, and then just let me say, um, like many of you, for me, this work is deeply spiritual. And, um, and this is a picture of my family um, at, at our, the, our village of Requa um, at the mouth of the Klamath River spilling into the Pacific Ocean. We are looking rough in this photo. We are much cuter than we look here. <laughs> But it's because we have spent the whole night um, uh, praying and singing and dancing for one of our young women during one of our, our puberty ceremonies um, called a flower dance. Um, and it's an ancient part of our heritage which is designed to create the ideal conditions for every young girl to become a healthy, strong young woman who has an enduring sense of purpose and belonging. And so before we continue on um, and bring up our our uh, panelists, I just want you to, oops, excuse me, to just take a quick moment to reflect on that moment. When have you felt a deep sense of belonging or meaning or well-being or purpose? Let's just take a moment. And can we just take a quick deep breath together and just allow ourselves to feel that feeling? 
So this session is a collective conversation. Uh, it's really aiming about refining these concepts, but really getting to, again, to Michael McAfee this morning. Like, these can just be words. This is not the work. And so the real question is, how do we turn these concepts, how do we turn this, these huge bodies of data into the work to actually transform the lives of the young people that we care about? And I also just want to name, it's important to say that we are not going to all hold the same definitions. In Hawaii, this might be known as ohano. In Texas, they might say love. Professor Cecchini might call this sovereignty. Um, and we are not going to be all working in the same way, on the same day, in the same system, at the same level. And that is part of the beauty of this network because we all hold the same bold aspirations for our community. And so as so we, what you'll hear today is people talking about this from different academic disciplines, different data methodologies. Some are gonna be looking at little, tiny, narrow interventions. Some are gonna be looking at big, bold, vast concepts and systems transformation. You are going to hear different cultural contexts and different generations. And that's all part of it. And that's part of this conversation today. And I just need to name, we are not alone in this endeavor. Um, to kickstart start our learning, we have several communities who are going deep on the BMWP with us. Uh, we've got Denver, do a little hands up or a shout out. Denver, Montana, <laughs> Del Norte and Tribal Lands, LA, Hawaii, Atlanta, and many others. And in addition to our community partners, we've also teamed up with a broad range of funders and funder networks. If any, we've got, we're co-convening with six funding networks. Can any of our funding partners who are here today, especially if you're new to our community, can you please raise your hand? Funders, funding partners. Welcome, welcome. We're delighted that you are here. And then furthermore, we have assembled this dynamic group of research experts and academics. You're going to hear um, from several of them today. Some of them are also our long-term partners who you know and love, like our youth researchers, John Powell, Sean Genright, Dr. Rashida Govan, Melody Barnes. And then we're, we're so excited to welcome new folks, including folks you will hear from today, Dr. Tiffany Brannon, who's in, in the house. Thank you, Tiffany. So today, our primary goal for this session is really, it's an invitation to all of you. You are the hearts and minds of this network to engage in this dialogue. We invite you to think about how do we turn these words into work. We ask you to, um, to hold in your mind uh, what's resonating with you, what's sparking, what feels good and true. Also, what clarifying questions do you have? Where does it feel sticky or stuck? What feels maybe even agitating? And then what other truths must we hold as we engage in this learning together? So our panelists, I will welcome them all up and introduce them, but please come on up. And they're going to do, we're going to do this like TED, stock, TED Talk style. So they're going to do a quick 10 minutes identifying, talking about each of the concepts of belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose. And then we're going to have conversations at, at our table. And if we have time, which we might not, we will um, we'll have some questions for the group. So panelists, please come on up. And I will introduce them, Dr. Amanda Ticini, the Assistant Professor of Education and Leadership and Innovation at Arizona State University. You should have all received a copy of her book. And she'll be talking about belonging. Um, Andrea Wagner is the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions. She is our colleague with Fresh Tracks, and she's also Yupik, Alaska native. Arnold Chandler from Forward Change Researcher, Policy Strategist, and Dr. Anthony Burrow is a Ferris Family Professor in Life Course Studies in the Department of Psychology at Cornell University. Welcome, panelists. Thank you so much for that generous welcome. Yate. I just want to just share how warm and full of love and exuberance I'm feeling today and yesterday and just like being around by the beautiful place of the you peoples and just acknowledging all the knowledge systems that you all are bringing to this, working alongside for our futures, for our youth, I'm in the right spot. 
Uh, yeah. I just want to say thank you to Geneva for inviting me to this event and also want to acknowledge I'm here alongside my beautiful daughter, Coral Tachitney, who is a fierce young native um, um, youth who's doing some incredible work also. I'm here to think about belonging with y'all. Can, can we do that? Can we do that together? Great. Belonging is a very popular term. And in higher education, it's been termed in, in numerous ways, especially in working in, in, in these predominantly white institutions. We want to ensure students are belonging. Freshman year, we're doing all the pomps and circumstances to ensure that students feel a sense of belonging. However, if you look at the definition of belonging, that the work that I do, it's, a, it's, it's defined as where a student is connected to a member of an institution. So if you dig deeper, it's this idea that belonging is integrating, guys is assimilating to a particular place where then I often wonder who sets the terms of belonging. So I take us back to a story of two students, 17 and 18 year old, these wonderful boys native young men, did all the things right as a proud mom or auntie that I would be proud of. They did all the things, they researched schools, they saved up money, they asked their mom, can I use the vehicle to drive to this school to go to a campus tour seven hours away? First time to use the vehicle. And as many of you know, handing the keys over to your child, or you, for them, you have always seen them as child, but they're adults. The keys is a mighty thing, it's huge. They go up to the tour. And when they got there a little bit late, because you know, campus tours are hard to find where to meet up, right? They park, they get there late. As soon as they get there, minutes later, they're apprehended by the campus police. There's actual audio footage of the woman who called the police, a white woman who used the language that these were creepy kids, they made her scared, and they don't belong. They don't belong. They don't belong. They don't belong. Who sets the, the terms of belonging? How is belonging defined and who belongs is the language that which I'm thinking about and what is for the book that you all, if you read it, is what I'm exploring more. And thank you all for the generosity of that book because proceeds of that also goes toward Native student scholarships. So in my, I'm from the, the and we have a story. I won't go into depth of the story because it's not winter time and I'm not supposed to. But what I can tell you this is that we are in the glittering world, the fifth world. Our stories tell us that we have gone and emerged in various worlds and our stories tell us that there was monsters and that our people, two twin warriors, fought to save our people from the monsters. There's a knowledge system that I'm bringing into this book, that I'm bringing into this conversation, into this room, to recognize that there are monsters today, y'all, that are continuously to take away our presence, our brilliance, and our sense of belonging. And I got this from one of the students. So in the book, it's about 10 students. During their, their first part is their senior year in high school. The second part is their first year in college. And one of the students, all wise, beautifully brilliant, Cecilia said, I think we're all warriors. I think we're all warriors in battle against modern day monsters. And so evoking what she shared with me, her wisdom, my book, I'm exploring what are the modern day monsters? Because if we don't do that, then we feel that we are at fault. We feel like, why are we constantly living in the struggle? As Native people, why are we always less than in all the educational markers? Why are we the most incarcerated? We start problematizing that we are the problem. And I wanted to tell young people, the system was built to create the conditions for you to suffer and struggle. Mm. So these systemic monsters are, then, but the way I'm defining are the interlocking structures of power rooted in white supremacy, settler colonialism, racism, heteropatriarchy, and capitalism that disrupt sovereignty and belonging. And I want to make a point. Sovereignty does not sound the same as nation state and governance and law. Sovereignty from an indigenous perspective is a rainbow full of brilliance. That's how our Navajo feel it. And it's about sharing and it's about being in relations to each other. 
together. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in way we think about our language and the way it's interpreted and the way what we're thinking and what I'm bringing when I talk about sovereignty. Systemic monsters are shape-shifting, man. They have been here for centuries. They go deep, mm -hmm. and their intentions are to maintain power over the land and over the peoples. And so one of the monsters that I'm talking about in the book is that they are real good about haunting us. Mm. And hauntings are the everyday ways that they operate that we don't even realize is happening. So one of the hauntings is, the, this is college enrollment numbers. Mm -hmm. This is from 2010 to 2020. And look at the arrows facing the American Indian Alaskan Native. And you can see the decrease and decline of Native enrollment in college. That hurts my heart. That has long-term implications. This has been going on for decades, and nobody is ringing a bell that our Native students' enrollment in college is decreasing. That hurts my heart for the futures. And so that is an example of a haunting, because it's every day, and no one is, is ringing the bell on those ways that it continues to replicate. I want to bring, I love the poets. Oh man, you all brought the adrenaline, the love, the energies into this. And I wanted to also bring poetry into this. So I have a good friend, Natalie Diaz, Mojave Indian. If you have not read her poem, Poetry, Postcolonial Love Poem, mm -hmm. this is one aspect of it, which speaks to this. At the National Museum of the American Indian, 68% of the collection is from the United States. I am doing my best to not become a museum of myself. I am doing my best to breathe in and out. I am begging, let me be lonely, but not invisible. So I want to recognize that in the book, I'm talking about these monsters, and I'm talking the way it's operating, but I'm also talking about the indigenous weapons. Because like what we are shared, there's joy. There's ways that we are continuously to be alive and thrive for our people. So indigenous weapons are knowledges and ethical engagements that are rooted in Navajo ways of knowing, of eh, kinship, relational base, that build survivance and reawaken power and sovereignty of indigenous presence and belonging. I'm here to say eh is our superpower. I introduced myself to you this, this, this afternoon and my Navajo language, which is my clanship. It's part of eh. It recognizes that if there's another Navajo, we share in relationships that we're related. But it's a, it's a teaching of understanding that we are in relations. But it moves beyond just clanships. It's being in relations to a place and a land. And so I tell my babies, eh is our superpower. If we were to really embody what it means to be in relations, can you imagine how our livelihood would be? If I knew that you were not feeling good and I felt it, that is in being relations. If I knew the Aspens were thirsty, that's being in relations. And it is hard work because being in relationships as natives, it's often glamorized and romanticized. But as you all know, being in relationships with someone for a long time is hard work. So it takes a lot of us to build that in our work. So I'm bringing the language of relational sovereign belonging. And this is the wisdom that the students brought to me that I write about in the book. It's understanding that moving these students, gosh, they are so wise. They move through and honor self-determination while being intricately woven into relations, including their ancestors, their more than human relatives, the land and place and even monsters. It's recognizing that Native people are not just in a binary, as you alluded to earlier, that we have complications, contradictions happening all the time. But our young people, are they know how to deal with that. Us older people, we get on our sides. And so I'm, the wisdom of this, the young people are, ten is my time, are telling us that we can be in relations and sovereign at the same time. It's like two opposing forces that often we think as contradicting can happen at the same time. So relational sovereign belonging is providing, what does that mean? Because we have to do this for our futures. And we have to show and we have to be the work that we do for our indigenous futures. And so this is the, what inspires me. 
And this is what inspires me with you all, is how can we think about these definitions of belonging that goes beyond the ways we often conceptualize it, that gets close to how we're thinking about it, and how the wisdom afforded by our young people are telling me relational sovereign belonging is potentially another language that we could utilize. I hear that so much. All right, I'm on. Thank you for that uh, wonderful and inspiring presentation. I'm, I'm delighted to follow it, a little intimidated to follow it. But I'm back uh, with my Aspen crew. I don't even know if most folks even remember me, but I am delighted to be back here with you. Uh, and I'm only supposed to do 10 minutes. If you guys know me, it's usually an hour and a half as usual. But I will keep this to 10 minutes. Uh, I may even go a little bit shorter. It depends. But my task is to answer the question, what is meaning making? And that can sound a little obscure. It has a specific, actually to say specific is, is overselling it. It has a range of meetings within the academic literature, but among social psychologists, where I got the use of this term from, it has a specific meaning. And I'm gonna give you the specific meaning that they draw on and why I think it's powerful and important. How many people remember this, this old, old thing, brought the old thing back, the life course framework? And I wanted to represent to you, though, what it is I'm saying about why meaning-making interventions are important and where they fit in the story of trying to change the lives of young people who we call opportunity youth. You all may remember me talking about the factors that predict uh, uh, not reaching middle class by middle age or completing college, or the most important of which, in my estimation, is avoiding incarceration, avoiding getting that felony scarlet letter in your life. And it starts all the way back with being absent from school, school suspensions, grade retention, being arrested as a juvenile or being incarcerated as a juvenile, having poor middle school grades or high school grades. All of those lead to a pivotal outcome, which is whether you graduate from high school. And I talked about before about the implications for, say, a black male in this country, not graduating from high school. In the, in the nationally, a black male who doesn't graduate from high school has a 70% chance of going to prison, of getting a felony conviction. And that's just something that is the anchor of my whole analytical view of the way to understand and challenge problems in our society. The fact that there's that big a difference. If you get a high school diploma nationally, you only have a 15% chance of going to prison. So think about that. 70% if you don't graduate for a black male, 15%. If you do, in the state of California where I'm from, it's 90% and 12%. Stunning numbers. But this becomes a crucial point, a crucial point in the journey of an opportunity youth. Now, do we see that felony conviction come to pass? Our hope is obviously not. And the question is, how do we intervene? And this is why I think meaning matters and why I'm going to lift up the importance of meaning. Because we know if you get a felony conviction, you're locked out of the labor market. Unstable employment, housing instability, long-term unemployment or underemployment, low income or poverty, and serious health outcomes that start to emerge, usually with hyperattention in your early 30s, a disease or condition that usually afflicts other folks in their 50s and 60s. We're trying to change the route, put them on track to opportunity pathways, graduate from high school, enroll in college, follow a pathway to a post-secondary credential that doesn't necessarily have to be a four-year degree, but provides a pathway into economic opportunity. A four-year, uh, completing college at a four-year uh, university, all of which contribute to the probability of stable employment, employment in a high-demand industry occupation, middle-class job, and good mental, mental or physical health. The goal here is to transform a life trajectory from following those orange pathways and be rerouted on the green ones. Now, my perspective on this has always been structural change is essential. And we're gonna talk about that in this conversation, but that's not, I wasn't brought here to do the structural change definition. I was brought here to do the meaning making uh, uh, conversation. And what meaning making has shown me is that our intervention paradigm for putting folks off of the orange onto green is incomplete. We have a sector that places a lot of focus on skill building and knowledge acquisition academic skills, 
socio-emotional skills, vocational skills. I'm not saying these things are problematic at all. They're absolutely essential. They are part of the equation. We see them as the inputs primarily for improving education, employment, and income outcomes. However, this paradigm is incomplete, especially when we're talking about young people whose identities are stigmatized, black, American, and Latino kids. To show you this illustration by example, there was a study done College students enrolled in a psychology course, and they were told two different things, separated into two different groups. One group was told, hey, we want you to complete these interesting logic puzzles. And uh, take these puzzles seriously, because we really value your feedback. And the class, by the way, was comprised just of black and white students. We want you to, once you complete these puzzles, tell us what you think of these puzzles, and we're going to uh, consider your thoughts and reactions on these puzzles for how we're going to modify or think about these puzzles going forward. That was one group of black and white students. Another group of black and white students were all told, you're about to take an IQ test. This is a measure of your intelligence. This is an assessment of some innate ability we can't quite put our finger on, but when we call it an IQ test, people have an IQ test reaction. Not the same way you have a puzzles reaction. And what they found was, there was a 20% difference in the test scores for black and white students when they were told it was an IQ test, and there was no difference when they were told they were puzzles. What is that? What is the thing that causes the difference there? That's meaning. That's not skills. That's not socio-emotional development. That's not your vocational aptitudes. That's meaning. And the meaning was tied to their stigmatized identity. And this made me realize something else has to go on here if we're going to intervene effectively for youth of color. Any context in which a young person tries to develop skills, along with that exercise are a set of existential questions that they are asking and answering, often unaware that they are even doing it. The posing of these questions and the answering of these questions is meaning making. That's what I mean by it, to be as concrete as possible. I am asking questions often without my awareness, and I'm answering those questions often without my awareness. These types of meaning-making uh, processes have been referred to as interpretations, construals, narratives, stories, mindsets, attributions. The reason they're so damn interesting to social psychologists is because people don't know they're going on. We can monitor your, monitor your biological reaction to these things going on, and you don't even know it's happening, but it's causing your brain to act differently. It's causing the parts of your brain that you might allocate to the prefrontal cortex, the really intelligent, latest de to develop part of our brain that allows us to solve complex problems. We reroute energy away from that part of our brain to our amygdala. And our amygdala does what? Manages our fight or flight response. It manages our vigil vigilance to threats. It makes us to respond to things that might harm us when we are told we're taking an IQ test. Examples of these existential questions are, who am I in this context? Who could I become? What are my goals? How will I accomplish my goals? Am I capable or le of learning and performing well? If I struggle, does it mean I can't do it? Am I valued? Does anyone here even notice me? Are there people here who I can connect to? Do people here value people like me? Am I viewed through a lens of a negative stereotype? This whole litany of conversations is happening and you're not even aware of it. And this is the big part of the problem we need to solve for adolescents. Not leave them to the mercy of these conversations that end up coming up with answers that are usually negative. Unconscious meanings suppress latent abilities. The negative answers happen in the unconscious part of people's minds when they have stigmatized racial and ethnic identities. That interacts with all the messages they've been flooded with, the stereotypical messages they've been flooded with throughout their life and they play out behind the scenes. I often say, you can tell yourself, everyone in this room, that you know for a fact that white people aren't inherently smarter than black people. You can tell yourself that for a fact, but your unconscious doesn't agree with you. And that is our dilemma. What we often observe that appears like the absence of skill is the absence of its expression. The skill is there, but it's suppressed. And we have to unsuppress it. And there's no level of tutoring we can do that will do that. We have to respond to the meaning itself. Usually the way this plays out for young people is they engage in the exercise and they feel demotivation. 
They're not excited about it anymore, and they don't know why, but usually that's a degradation in their excitement. Over time, they're like, I'm not gonna even try hard on things like that, because I know I suck at it. And eventually is, I'm not the type of person who should even be doing those things. I don't belong in those rooms, I don't take on those challenges, I don't do those tasks. We need to add meaning making to our intervention paradigm. We need social reforms that alter the prevalence, structure, and pathways of opportunity. We don't get away from that because we might improve meaning and improve outcomes. That is still the primary reality we have to confront. We're not gonna walk away from building skills either. Skills allow young people to seize opportunities when they are available. We cannot deny them the aptitudes and the skills. In fact, young people talked about being put in positions where they might influence policy making, having a civic voice. The problem is no one built their skills to do that. So skills are an essential piece, even for all the things we think of outside of education, employment, and so forth. The last thing is we need to marshal the formidable body of social psychological evidence that tell the, tells us we can alter meaning and liberate latent potential, latent abilities. That we need much, as much liberation going on inside of us as we need for our society as a whole. And I'll stop there, thank you. All right. I'm getting up here too just to be Andrea's hype person, really, at the end of the day. Thanks Juan. Am I, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, waka wina ata, Andrea Wagner. Hi, my name is Andrea Wagner. I'm Yupik, Alaska native. I'm with the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions. I love you guys. I um, support the Youth and Young Adult Wellbeing Project. All right. So let's take a moment. Everyone, close your eyes. Um, think of a moment, a space where you felt happy, where you felt supported, healthy even. What did that look like? What did that feel like? Take time to be in this moment. Take a deep breath in, take a deep breath out. Open your eyes when you're ready. Um, this exercise brought you back to a moment of well-being. I don't know if you can tell, but Geneva and I and Juan are all coworkers, and we all think exercises like this are very important to open up our speeches. Um, but coming back to this, what factors contribute to well-being? What factors do we need to contribute to well-being? And who gets to define and measure youth and young adult well-being? So before we get to the good, chunky stuff, we're storytellers. So here's the story of how this came to be. Is Eric Stegman in the room? Eric, are you here? All right. So if you get to see Eric, you can send him a thank you for us, because he answered a cold email from Cynthia Weaver at the NE Casey Foundation back in the day when he was working at the Center for Native American Youth. This was around 2017, 2018. So for any young people and any of us young professionals, always answer your emails from random people. <laughs> Cynthia Weaver reached out and she was like, hey, I, we're hosting a convening on belonging and we're bringing professors and we'd love for you to bring some young leaders to present, like to just be in the room and, and help us think about this stuff. And so uh, in that time, um, one of our, so we went, uh, got to, sat at a panel very similar to this one, and one of our young leaders said, hey, I love y'all, I respect y'all, but if you're talking about youth and young adult well-being, why aren't young people the experts up here? Why are we always m being measured about, but never measured with or measured by, right? And so uh, that really kicked off our, our project, which was a group of, uh, we got together in 2019. Little did we know that right around the corner was a global pandemic. And that changed everything because then we had to start thinking about well-being within the context of a global pandemic. And what did that mean for our communities, our own well-being in a virtual space and, and things like that. One of the things that I want to point to is that 250 young people have participated in the uh, implementation, delivery, and authorship of this project to date. So within the last two and a half years of that, uh, that's where we are. And I'd like to, for you to meet them. This is about half of them. These are the young professionals and experts who are leading this work. And Andrea and I really take it to heart that 
we are here sharing their words because at this very moment, they are at the American Evaluation Association, the largest evaluation association conference. We got accepted, our proposal got accepted there. So they are there presenting on this work simultaneously as we're speaking. So shout out to, to, to them if they're uh, looking at us on YouTube. But many of these leaders are also here today. So uh, if you're part of the well-being research experts uh, team, stand up. And you know who you are. Kim, Devin, Israel. Sierra. Sierra. So we stand on their labor and love and work. And, and as we, if you haven't attended one of the sessions that they are leading, please do so. All right, so here at OAF, we pretty much have a motto that we try to like use and live by within our work, nothing for us without us. We definitely center this when we work with youth and young adults in our communities. And so this is how uh, this shows up in our well-being project. And here are some of like our core values that we, we use coming into this project. One, we're youth-led and we're youth-informed. What does that look like? We have youth and young adults in every room, all the decision-maker rooms, but they don't just have a seat. They have equal voice. You can't bring youth and young adults in a room, make a checkbox, and say, great. You actually have to hear what they have to say. Our project is youth-informed, and we actually have three youth and young adult consultants on our core planning team. They came to us and said, we want more responsibility. We want to be on the back end. We want to do the logistics of this project. We said yes. We hired them as consultants, which goes to the next point. Youth are paid for their expertise and knowledge. You don't go to a job just for fun and then don't get paid. So why would we do that to youth and young adults? So our youth consultants are paid. Our youth and young adults researchers are paid. They are paid for the knowledge that they have and the work that they do. Um, and third, the youth get to take this project and reclaim data on themselves, for themselves, and in their community. So they get the opportunity to define and measure well-being. Um, all right, so we've heard about 2019 to 2021, but what have they been up to since then? They took all that data, they pulled out key themes and findings from that data. There's three different cultural affinity groups, uh, Latine Bienestar, Alaska Native American Indian, and Black Expressions. Each of these groups found some um, key themes and findings from the data, which you can see on the graph above. But what I want to pay attention to is the green circle. These are the common uh, key themes and findings that they pulled that they found out within all our communities contribute to their well-being. For some examples, healthy environment, cultural connection, financial stability, <laughs> mental health, and balance and peace. So with all the key themes and findings, they were able to define well-being. But before I show you the definition, I want to make note that this definition is a working definition. They taught us that well-being is a journey, that well-being is dynamic. And so next time you see this definition, it might change. And if it does, that is on growth. OK, so well-being is a journey. It is dynamic and ever-changing. It's about balance, juggling school and work, family, friends, wants and needs, achieving peace amongst various pressures, including financial constraints. It is trauma-informed. The presence of intergenerational and individual trauma impacts well-being. Like anything we do, we can't, we can't do this alone. So I invite each and every single one of you to join us on this journey. As Devin has joined us and uh, many other leaders, uh, you know, you don't get through the interweb inter, uh, of the ecosystem on yourself, by yourself. Uh, we're hitting on a chunky piece of this BMW P, uh, purpose work. Um, and so to the next slide. Um, Really, our work is rooted in YPAR, youth, Particip youth Participatory Action Research. If you're familiar with it or not familiar with it, this, is, this means that we are following the youth leadership. And uh, they have come up with everything from the questions to the inquiries to the way that methodology we're doing. We've gone everything through nominal group technique to, to um, um, many other Types. I'm not a researcher, I'll be honest. <laughs> so there's a lot of terminology that I'm learning as well too. But uh, what YPAR centers on is three 
central elements. One of them is to inquire, to ask the questions, to sit with the pain, to sit with the joy, to sit with it and acknowledge it and recognize it and learn from it. The other is understanding. So how do we go from that moment and start to really um, develop our own definition of well-being and how we start to, to measure that? which is where we're headed to next. How do we measure that and how do we create a tool that is reflective and almost um, at a point that it can be responsive to the needs of the young people at the moment. And so when we ask our young people, hey, where do you want this tool to live? Do you want us to measure systems impact of well-being? Do you want us to measure like organizational well-being, community well-being, individual well-being? They indicated that they wanted to be individual and community level because Young people need to know where their well-being is at that point in time, and they need the resources to access to benefit their own well-being at that moment. The next part of this is that we will, um, we, we have just finalized this month our partnership with 3C Institute. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, with 3C Institute, who will be taking us on the next journey to actually actionalize the tool itself and take it to the next level. So the invitation here is to help us validate this tool, uh, to come and join us on this journey, because we are eager and excited to work with any and every one of you to uh, develop what that tool looks like, what it feels like, what are the outcomes coming out of it, and how do we actionalize it to, to the next level. The, uh, um, the Youth and Young Adult Wellbeing Report is uh, up for grabs, so feel free to scan this QR code. It'll uh, give you more, more uh, information on what we're doing. And then the last thing that I'll share uh, before I handed it back to Andrea is that um, in the inquiry part, what we've learned is to really center young people as, as the leaders. And so um, that's, that's why Andrea is really going to close us out. Yeah. Yeah, so I support youth and young adults, and I am actually not gonna close this on my word. I'm gonna let them have the last word. So this quote is from Niar Frankson, one of our youth and young adult researchers, who is also a consultant with us on our core team. Um, young people are capable of defining the world around them, and they are capable of defining themselves in relation to that. Our project is a space that's grounded in collaboration, diversity, and healing. Goyana, thank you. Awesome. Um, if we could go back to the start of the presentation, I'll open with the with the beginning here. Um, the the first, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. How are you doing today? Good. It's really good to see you. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Um, this is a gorgeous crowd. I can't believe nobody said that when they were up here, but this is an absolutely gorgeous crowd. Um, normally at this time. I would be lecturing students whose faces look at me with a lot of disdain and disappointment. So the fact that some of you are smiling, it already feels like I want, I'm gonna stop right now before, before you really get to know me. This is a really, really cool experience. Um, one of the privileges of speaking last after a whole host of brilliant people and the spoken word is that you forget everything that you wanna say, really. I, it's like, I'm still thinking about tables, like the periodic table, like seriously, I'm still, I have a lot of reflecting to do today. So um, thank you for what's been shared already. This is really remarkable. I suspect that my, job here is to motivate a conversation about purpose and talk about its contours, how it might be distinct from some of these concepts or, or distinguishable or associated in some way. And I'll try to do that, but right now my mind is reeling with just how much overlap there is between these concepts. But I want to try to point out a couple of distinctions. And one thing I think this was alluded to earlier is tomorrow I'll have a chance to go a little bit deeper um, and talk about the science of purpose. So if anybody's here for that. Um, I'll jump into things that way. And so it gives me a chance today to talk a little bit around the edges. If I want to talk about purpose, particularly youth purpose, I want to talk about the world that young people are in as a way of talking about what purpose actually is. And to do that, um, I'll start here. I want to show you, I'll show you something that I saw, that I experienced in, in my own life. This is a video clip, and it's a, it's a scene. And the actor in this scene is, is, is my daughter. Um, her name is Persephone. It's a big name for a two-year-old, I know. So we call her Percy. But Percy in this scene, um, just to set it up a little bit, Percy was sitting on my, on my feet. 
Okay, so she was sitting at my feet, watching me as I was throwing a ball up to myself, kind of catching it like this. So she's watching me do this, and I'm looking past her at the TV screen. So she's watching this play out. And then I dropped the ball, and this is what happened. <laughs> Pretending like I can't reach it. She gets off from where she was sitting and comes to reach it and tries to get it and loses it. And hands it Thank back to you. me. Thank you. And then... <laughs> I thank her, she checks with me, is that what you wanted? And then she goes back to where she was sitting. Th that's a remarkable achievement. Um, by training, I'm a developmental psychologist. So of course, the first thing I wanna show you is the early period of the lifespan, but um, <laughs> it is within the first year of our life that we develop the capacity to detect that other people want something. We can see it. We can see that they're striving for something, that they're pursuing something. We do that around seven or eight months. It's a remarkable phenomenon that we can tell. And it's not just that. We can also choose, are we going to become co-conspirators? Are we going to collaborate? Or are we going to be a headwind to that? Do we want to help? Are we going to leave our perch and go give them the ball back that they dropped? Or are we going to grab it for ourselves? or do nothing at all, right? We have that capacity at, within the first year of life, which means everybody here has that capacity too. I know it because I've been interacting with it from last night's dinner, this afternoon, this morning's conversation during breakfast. You're here because you know people, you know entire communities that are after something, that are pursuing something. So if we're gonna talk about purpose, if we're really gonna talk about purpose, we should acknowledge that it's a very social, a wildly social thing. We sometimes we talk about purpose as an individual resource a psychological asset, and it might be that, but it's, it's taking place, it's being enacted in a social audience. And so we can become co-conspirators in the purposes that are around us. And I wanna, I wanna talk about that a little bit as we, go, as we go into this. So what is it? What is Percy seeing, right? What is purpose? Maybe I'll take a shot at defining it. I would just begin that I think the, what purpose is in some ways depends on who you ask. There's a lot of definitions available and tomorrow I'll share a couple of definitions. But here's one definition that we can think about. In the research literature, purpose can be thought of as a central and self-organizing life aim. In a second, we can talk about its functions, the things that it goes on to do. But as a central self-organizing life aim, what Patrick McKnight and Todd Cashton mean by this essentially is that this is a center of gravity for all the things that we think about as our self or identity, our motivations, our values, our likes, our dislikes, right? the people we care about. And it can hold on to those things. A purpose can tether together all of those things, hold them, and direct them towards something. Right? So if identity is who you are, yourself is all the things that you comprise who you are, a purpose is your direction. Where are you going? Right, so when we think about purpose, it's, it's in that vein. It's taking all of these things and it's putting them in motion. It's putting those things toward a prospective or future sort of intentionality. And that powerful thing can organize goals, it can manage behaviors and provide a sense of meaning. I bet there's terms on this screen that you use, we use interchangeably with purpose. We oftentimes think of goals as very much related to purpose. We use that sort of interchangeably. We don't tend to think of purpose as synonymous with goals. Right? So, a goal might be something that can be accomplished. I have a goal to graduate. I want to get a job. I want to affect policy change. You can do those, I don't know if you want to, but you could go out and do those things and actually accomplish them. A purpose is an organizer, a higher order organizer of goals. So once you accomplish a goal, a purpose might come in to tell you what goal should you pursue next. Goals don't naturally tend to lend themselves to clarity of what you should do after you accomplish a goal. I'm not bashing goals. Goals are important. Some of my best friends are goals. So goals are really, really important. But I want to, I want to try to motivate an understanding that purpose is sort of like a, a, sort of a, a larger sort of container for the goals that we have. And we can go through this in this way if we want to come back to these things. So is this worth having? Is a sense of purpose in life worth the effort, right, of requiring this sort of higher order sense? Well, the past 30 or 40 years of psychological research suggests that it is that no matter where you look in the literature, what you tend to find is that purposeful individuals enjoy greater health and well-being, greater social connection, less loneliness. They tend to be more creative or more curious. They're explorers, these purposeful people. Right? They're out in the world mixing it up. They want to figure out what's going on in the world. Young uh, purposeful individuals tend to ha enjoy greater academic success, whether that's by GPA or, or high school graduation or just deeper engagement 
when they're learning, even things that they used to tell us they were relatively boring. If you give young people a chance to reflect for just a few minutes on their purpose, they're able to say, actually, I need to hear more about this thing you were talking about. Now that I'm thinking about myself in the future, what you have to say may actually be deemed more important, more interesting, more relevant to who I'm going to be. If it's not right now, it could be who I'm going to be. In the past 10 to 15 years in the psychological literature, the biggest sort of heat in the, in the literature comes from work on resilience. Really, as you walk around the body, purposeful people tend to enjoy greater resilience to st stress and challenge. Right? Um, it's not that purposeful individuals avoid all stress and challenge. In fact, in a lot of studies we do, purposeful individuals uh, experience a lot of conflict or challenge. But they're able to persist through those in greater tact. Right? They're able to sort of regulate their physiological and psychological experiences as they're going through stress and challenge. So in other words, purpose, I think, is on the list of things that might be part of a better world that we can cultivate. Right? I mean, it's something that I would want for you and I think you would want for your friends and family. I think you should even want it for your neighbors, even if you don't like your neighbors. I mean, the, the talk this morning, you would want to live around purposeful neighbors, right? You would want them to have this. It's much better than living around people who, who don't feel this to some, to some degree. OK, so here's the question then. Get this question all the time. All right, so that's wonderful. Purpose sounds great, but is it actually something that young people walk around with? I will tomorrow talk ad nauseum about how purposeful youth actually are by almost any metric. They score at or above their adult counterparts. I don't really understand this question. Right? I, get, I get why it comes up sometimes, but if you take one minute with the, with the literature, purposeful, purpose does not seem to be sort of elusive in the, in the lives of young people. And this, this, con this convening is sort of riddled with examples of that if you're just paying attention to it. But what about us? Do we think youth are purposeful? I think it's a different kind of question we can ask. So we've done this. We do studies where we ask adults. These are data that come from adults. Um, about 600 adults collected across the United States. We ask them, how purposeful are people at different periods of the lifespan? So think of different stages, infants, children, across adolescence, right, young adulthood, through midlife and old, old age, very old age. How purposeful on a scale of 0 to 100, not at all to vary, how purposeful do you think these people are? Well, as it turns out, we as adults don't typically think of children or infants as very purposeful. It's not the first thing that comes to mind when we think about infants and children. What about adolescents? The second, now we're in the second decade of lifespan, maybe more so than children, but we still aren't passing the midpoint on the scales that we'd use to assess these things. Right? This clashes drastically with how young people actually feel, but this is how purposeful we think they actually are. It's not until adulthood where we pass the 50% mark. Right? And now we say, well, now these are people, these are the purposeful individuals in our society, the adults in, in the room. And we never lose that. We never drop back below the midpoint when we think about how purposeful people are. So to be an adolescent means to be a member of a group of people who feel purposeful, but are navigating a social ecology where they're not sort of credited as being so. I would just liken this to how we actually think um, when we ask questions of how much do we like these, these periods of the lifespan. So there we go, there's infants and children. They're the most likable people on the planet. Like, luckily, Percy, we like Percy. She has a lot of complaints, a lot of suggestions of the way we do things differently as parents. But we, we like her, and they enjoy the benefit. It's good, that, it's good that we like the youngest among us. But look at adolescents. We drop down about as low as we're going to get, and we spend the rest of our lives getting that likeness back. So adolescents are people we don't consider particularly purposeful, and we don't necessarily like them. I don't mean you and you. I just mean we should concede the fact that as adults, we belong to a group of people that don't necessarily think favorably of adolescents. So we should be, we should be honest about that, because I, th I think it can shape drastically some of the intervention work and who needs to be brought into that. What, what they need to learn as staff, as neighbors, as teachers, as educators, to really sort of do the work that we need to do here. Finally, I'll just close with this point, is that if we're going to think about cultivating purpose, purpose I do think is a resource, and I think it's something that we can continue to cultivate. We might do young people a favor that for just a minute, putting down this idea of purpose as a trait, as this enduring, stable thing that young people walk around with and can articulate at the drop of a dime. There's paper on the, on the tables. If I said, Take, grab a pad and tell me your purpose, and you have five minutes, my guess is there'd be as many blank pages at the end of that as there are actual answers, even among this group. Right? We tend to engage young people around being able to articulate their purpose as if it's just sitting there in their backpack. And whenever you ask about it, they can articulate what it is. That's a tough thing to do. And all we do when we, you know, applications to college or jobs, tell me your purpose statement. That's a really tough thing to do. 
What if we flip that on its side? And instead of thinking about purpose as this enduring trait, thought about it as a state, a dynamic, fleeting experience. Every speaker so far has talked about this, asking questions, how do you feel right now? Right? What if we think of purpose as an affect or an emotional state? Right? Um, my feelings are fleeting. I, most of my moods don't survive sleep cycles. I felt one way when I woke up. I feel very different now. The suggestion was go down to the river, take a walk. I bet you feel different later. What if we thought of purpose in the same way? At what point over the past week did you feel particularly purposeful? I see the time. I can't believe they're going to make me stop talking about purpose. I can't stop. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going. I'll wrap, I'll wrap up just by saying more I have more tomorrow. I will simply say, if we think about inviting young people to reflect on moments of purposefulness, we can turn those moments into routines and habits. Oh, it's every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, your most purpose. Oh, you're in these classes. You're with these friends. You're in this after school program on those days. We can routinize purpose and stand a better chance of actually naming what it is in a stable, enduring way. I'll end on that point. Thank you very much for your time. That was our time check if you didn't catch what was happening. So uh, let's just take a few minutes, maybe three, because I really want to create space for our folks to talk amongst their tables. You have now all, for sort of the first formal time, heard each other's definitions of the belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose. As we are trained to, as I shared, link these concepts together to have this larger, more aspirational frame to catalyze our work, reimagining how we might use belonging, meaning, well-being, and purpose to transform systems, structures, narratives, institutions, to not only improve life outcomes for youth and young adults of color, but also to expand justice, to improve mm -hmm. our democracy. What might be the power of linking these concepts together? Obviously, we heard interwoven pieces all throughout. What also might be challenging about linking these concepts together? And, and this is right, this is just the beginning of the conversation. And then we're going to turn it to you all to have table conversations. Anyone have a burning well, answer? I think the concepts are inherently linked, <clears throat> is what I gathered from the conversation. Um, <clears throat> We can impose a relationship between them mm -hmm. if we wanted to. Um, the way I think about meaning making just in that construct, even my own discovery, is this idea that it's a separate arena that we can influence to change people's lives. That is what's salient about it. And all the other things that have been talked about can fit in a paradigm of using meaning to change people's lives. I don't think we've ever used it effectively in thinking about young people or even thought that meaning matters all that much if they would just act right and study longer. <laughs> uh, the, the, the ascendancy and the, the gradual vanishing of, of grit is kind of a case in point in this idea. Grit could be, grit could have been very much framed and played, in my opinion, as a meaning-based concept. But it was operationalized primarily as a behavioral concept and your reaction to that behavior. <laughs> And it felt more like another version of an imposition on young people of, if you just show compliance in this regard, you'll see mm -hmm. success. This is trying to open up and be responsive to the meanings that they are inherently jungling and taking those very seriously in intervention um, to the point of not seeing adolescence as purposeful fits right into the mold of the paradigms that we have, which is if we just fix what's broken, feel what's missing, they'll be right. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll perform correctly. Uh, and I think in many ways, a lot of what this research shows is we have that completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I may add, I, I, I wanted to, I'm coming in from an education standpoint, which oftentimes we measure students based upon reading scores, math scores, you know, at the tests that we do. And I, and I I'd argue that that's measuring towards um, towards whiteness, and we're benchmarked often towards uh, another population. We don't design, native people are not designing those tests <laughs> or like, are measuring how they do it. Whereas then I see these, all these concepts 
as a way to address that there's other ways of measuring how mm -hmm. our people are doing that we need to do better at. Mm -hmm. And it also puts the attention not just individually, but on the structures. Mm -hmm. Because belonging is not just an individual situation, it's the conditions that create the environment That's for right. a person to feel like they belong. Yep. And if we were to focus on the way systems have been failing, our native students and indigenous and black and Latinx and queer students and disabled students, then we can better assess how the environments are contributing to that. And that connects with purpose, meaning, and well-being. So I think this is an opportunity for us to like flip the script. That's right. Put the mirror back on the monsters so that we can then see how it infuses and supports our people. Yes. Wow. So the that was amazing. The first thing that came to mind for me was all I could think about was Jamil, the silent H, healing. Yes. For any of these things to happen, we have to heal. And by convening mm -hmm. together as community, creating cross-cultural connections, allowing space for us to connect, to heal, to talk about what's happened in our communities as young people, as just organizations, all of this stuff is like allowing for belonging, meaning, well-being to happen. And so just like starting here, and we're already doing it, if you give mm -hmm. the space for work, good work will come, mm -hmm. but we have to build community to be interconnected. Beautiful. Any closing thoughts? Okay, I, okay yeah. sure. Um, I totally agree with, agree with this. I, I would add one additional perspective that um, right now, as this journey is beginning, I think it's important to name the vision and the concepts mm -hmm. discreetly so you know what you're talking about. You kind of know what you're focusing on. I, I think it's important in time to think about what is our theory, our working understanding about, about the sequence of these things. When I talk about purpose, there may be an assumption that a young person or a person has actually done some important self or identity work, mm -hmm. right? Bef and then that may give rise to something like belonging. Mm -hmm. It could also be the case that when a person feels like they belong, it opens up channels for this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to, to name them as discrete things, knowing there could be a relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's denying that these things are correlated or mm -hmm. associated, mm -hmm. but, it, but, by, but by naming them and then ostensibly measuring them, we have a chance of actually looking at the sequence by which they arrive mm -hmm. and putting resources in places where they're likely to happen. Mm -hmm. so, to the point that was made on the life course, mm -hmm. the, the conversation began in adolescence, mm -hmm. right? Or the way we think about who's likable, who's purposeful. It, we have, the, depending on our developmental stage, these things actually carry, are we missing something earlier that's really important? Is there some downstream consequences that's important? Um, the other, I think, issue here is that when we think about concepts that exist, I saw this happen in the literature when it came to grit. Mm -hmm. So one issue with grit is it has almost perfect overlap with another concept called conscientiousness. Mm -hmm. So there's a jingle jangle in the literature. We basically have two names now for the same phenomenon. So it's hard for both to persist. Like, what should we call this? So whether that's a problem to you or you want to sort of embrace that or not, is are these concepts actually discrete? Should we measure them as discrete things? Or when we talk about meaning and purpose, are we really fundamentally just talking about the same thing? Mm -hmm. That's an important thing if you want to measure outcomes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. We have just a few minutes, so rather than talking amongst your whole table, can you turn to a neighbor or two and just have a conversation? What is this sparking for you to Michael McAfee? How, is, how are these words looking like work in your work? Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, run sheet.
Okay. Okay, let's wrap it on up. Finish your final thoughts. And we save just a little bit of time for questions from the audience. Who has a spicy and brief question that you'd like to ask our panel? Spicy and brief. Oh, right here. Oh. Yeah, do we can hear you. Ooh, the question was, how do we define healing, the silent H in the BMWP? How do we define healing? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Oh. Oh. That's a tough one. That is. Do you want to... Yeah, I think, so the question, thank you for that generous yeah. question, and it's really, I think, putting us all to pause and think about it. I haven't, I would say from a Navajo perspective, for us is hojon. It's really looking at the language of a peoples. And so for us, hojon means like, to, is, is harmony, to live in a life of, and it's, it's a purpose, it's a purpose that's our livelihood is hojon. And so it's to live a long and happy life even amidst monsters. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that journey toward doing that, of living that way, is as our healing practices are moving in that direction. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. One more question, then we'll wrap it up. Here it comes. The mic's right behind I'm you. Sorry. And listen to the four group. I'm trying to understand how we leverage these as tools and like what and how do we use them as practitioners that are here right mm -hmm. are these screwdrivers where we go to fix something or like light bulbs in the room because there's so many different things that are here that yeah. we're trying to balance between purple purposefulness meaning making belonging how do we as practitioners take this back home and use it yeah mm -hmm. that's great I mean, I've got one quick answer, which is stay tuned for more, including tomorrow. Um, in addition to the plenaries, there will be specific breakout sessions. Arnold's doing a deep dive. The Other New Belonging Institute has a, a principles for designing for belonging, um, the plenary um, at lunchtime. But did somebody else want to add one more answer? Um, <clears throat> so the concepts of that, that are in the constellation of what I call meaning making uh, are, and how I've studied them are attached to specific types of interventions. So they operationalize the meaning of belonging, of self-affirmation, of growth mindset in specific ways, but they're all about meaning. There's a book called The Handbook of Wise Interventions that profiles many of these fairly brief interventions. They're brief in, in, in session, but they might be conducted over the course or span of an entire year. Um, there's pathways to success. So my, my deep dive on this happens, I think, on a different day, and it's not a big group, right? I'm Tomorrow not... at 10 o'clock. Isn't that the structural racism one? Oh, that's right, yes. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have the dive that I normally do on this. Um, Can you come I'll tell you what, there's the Striving and Thriving Boston report on Thursday. <laughs> So if you're going to be here on Thursday, I do a deep dive on striving and thriving. Do I do it for a different audience? How about Boston in May? Okay. Is this a call for that's Arnold a, to come back to, with away. us in Boston in May? Yeah. Arnold will be there. I, I just want to emphasize, there are very applied <laughs> approaches to these ideas, and there's evidence on their consequences yes. for outcomes for long term that I summarize. And so uh, I, I want to leave you with that, yeah. short of leaving you with some actual... Yeah. practical guidance right yeah. now. So sorry for that. Thank you all. That is time. Can we get one more round of applause for our new partners? So, um, so let me connect this dot really quickly for y'all. We'll build on this tomorrow, but um, let's see if this one works. Okay, that's better. 
So we'll, we'll build on this more tomorrow, but just to be clear, as we thought about our learning agenda, here, learning agenda here and where we wanted to start, this idea that we are really thinking about this broader equity movement and we are holding in the frame of the equity movement, what are the practices? What is the everyday work we are doing? The ideas, the themes, the concepts, but the actual work and the practices that bring to life this vision we have around advancing equity, advancing greater belonging. This plenary was an opportunity to begin to contextualize that, to begin to ground it, to take those big ideas around how we get to a society, to a democracy that really is deeply committed to the all and beginning to unpack some of the practices that get us closer to achieving that vision. We're going to continue to build on this when we come together tomorrow, and we're gonna have a conversation about narrative change and cultural strategy, because that's the other part of this work that we must also couple and marry with the type of practices, the type of research and rigor that we heard about here today. But what's so important for you all to take out of this particular conversation is to begin to have additional texture to what it looks like, what it means in our everyday work, whether we're talking about belonging and changing the post-secondary system, whether we're talking about meaning making and how young people of color begin to have a different internal conversation with themselves that really changes and reframes how they understand the power of their identity, whether we are talking about well-being and we're connecting it to the absence of intergenerational trauma in ways that promote greater healing for all of our young people, or whether we are thinking about purpose and our little two-year-old babies and how they begin to understand that at such a delicate age and it translates into their adolescence and into adulthood. What we want y'all to do is understand that yes, each of these, these auras have very, very significant and profound meaning, but together they can help us transform this world for all of our, all of our young people. So please join me in thanking these panelists and we look forward to seeing y'all back here tomorrow at 8 a.m. and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Enjoy your time in Aspen.